Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode seven of the Millennials in Print podcast. I'm Alex Krupski, back again with my co-host, Jake Hoffman. We are here today with Tim Eliason and Andrew Wilder from Linden Meyer Central. Um, they are a paper print and packaging company, paper supplier, paper broker, um, and they are here with us today to just chat and have a little chat and talk about paper print packaging the whole deal everything <laughs> they also have definitely come the farthest from the podcast <laughs> and so the earliest too. and the earliest this is by so far this the, is the morning one it <laughs> should be good so um to start if you guys just kind of want to touch base or talk with us a little bit about how you kind of got into the industry how'd you find your way how'd you get here today well that's a really good question jake <laughs> um no, I've been in the business for 36 years. It's, and it's, I love this industry. It's, you know, the people I like mostly. It's not like you're doing a real estate deal or an investment banking thing. It's, it's not intense like that, but it's, it's, it's really fun. It's, it's, it's just got a great group of people. They're all marketers. You know, they're fun to be around. They like to be entertained for yeah. the most part, you know. <laughs> uh, but I started um, the business... I grew up as a farm kid in Iowa, so I knew I wanted to get out of Iowa as quickly as possible. So I went to the University of Iowa, got my degrees, had four offers when I graduated. One was to sell refrigerators in Atlanta. Another one was to sell shampoo in Madison, Wisconsin. Another one was to sell automotive warranties in Flint, Michigan. And the other one was to sell printing in California. It was an easy decision. Okay. <laughs> California for the win. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that's how I got in the printing business. Shampoo in Wisconsin, though. I mean, that Procter and Gamble <laughs> hurt. Of oh, big companies. <laughs> uh, well, I just uh, wanted to extend thanks to, to yeah, Jake no and problem. Alex for, for having us here today. Thanks and, for and, joining. And, uh, Tim and I both were saying that this might be the coolest thing that we've, we've done in the industry. <laughs> uh, so you guys are on the right track. Um, I've, I've been in the industry a little bit uh, less than than Tim, even though I probably look older than, than Tim, <laughs> but um, it, it's, it's, been a, it's been a great ride, met, met some wonderful people. Um, I started in the industry in 2003, okay. um, and I actually came in by way of the, of the print side of the business. Uh, started working with R.R. Uh, R. Donnelly in 2003. I, I grew up in Chicago, and then they actually moved me out uh, to, to the West Coast and primarily been on the catalog side of the business. Yep. And I, I think that the most exciting part about this is that th this is an industry where you're, you're dealing with all different levels on, on the customer side. Everything from um, someone who is involved in circulation planning, someone who's involved in print buying, all the way up through the CEO or owner of these companies. And it's afforded me as a, uh, I'd like to say young executive, but not as young <laughs> anymore, right? Um, but it's afforded me an opportunity really to gain a great understanding on business in general because y you really are involved, especially when you're on the catalog side for a lot of these companies in a very big spend category and a yeah. big, big Definitely. part of their their sales revenue engine. So you play a big role. You're important in that in their supply chain and helping them succeed. So y you get welcomed in and you really get a chance to learn the business. And the one thing I would say, you know, going forward that I'm really, really excited about is print is not going away. It's changing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. It's going to be a very, very important component, in my personal opinion, to how all these different companies of different sizes communicate with their client base. So um, I think we all can just stay tuned on what that's going to look and feel <laughs> like, but yeah. uh, it's not going yeah. anywhere. It's just going to be changing. And I think the, the companies that will be successful in this, this industry are the ones that are looking at that, staying close to their customers. And I hope we can be included as, as part of that group that remains successful. I believe we will because we are doing our best to, to listen yeah. and, <laughs> and, 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 and morph as needed. Yeah. So one of the – so interesting time to come into the industry, obviously, 2003, things are humming had a little recession, kind of came back. So one of the things that you kind of talked about is the cus the customers, right, at all different levels. Uh, one of the things that I've definitely noticed is what used to be sort of a dedicated print buyer is now evolved into basically whoever has enough time or raises their hand at the table <laughs> right. to say, sure, I'll take on print. Right. So how has that kind of changed, and how have you guys kind of navigated that? All of a sudden you're sitting down with a digital media 
specialist as an example and sure. trying to talk to them about paper. How well, have you guys in, ma- in many that? cases, you're just trying to establish that print is still relevant, you yeah. know, because some of these guys, they they haven't had the history in printing as we have, and they really, mm-hmm. l- they don't find it sexy. You know, that person it, it may, may find uh, email and social and, 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 uh, and, and display and so forth much more sexy because, for one thing, it's fast and they can change yeah. it. It's data-driven. It's, it's very, very cool and it's easy. You know, it's easy yeah. to do. So what we have to do is make sure they understand that print is credible, that it's the most credible medium. Print has probably more permanence. People hold on to it for longer than they hold on to other pieces of, of uh, digital uh, information. And, you know, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, it's, it's much more impactful to the senses uh, when you look at a piece of print. So, first of all, you got to keep them focused on that. And what does that all translate into? A, it translates into a better response rate yeah. than digital. That said, that said, the big problem with, with print is it's not fast, okay? And that's what Take we have to work on. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. have to cut down, we have to cut down turn times from 20 to 30 days to more like seven to 10 days. And then yeah. you can compete with an email that can, can, can be sent out instantaneously. Well, I think you kind of hit on it, at least from my perspective. I've only been in the industry for a few years. I came from a digital marketing background. Right. So I think it's the education component that wasn't there for me, where it's, I thought the same thing, print wasn't sexy. But it really is when you get ingrained into it. It's. Yeah. I think the creative element is there big time. I think even maybe more so than digital ads. I think it's just understanding and, and, and having to take some time to learn a little bit more about it. Right. And to test it, you know? Test it, yeah. And I think it ingrains with social really well. They integrate very, very well together. So, like you said, when you the more integrated you get both of them, yeah. the more powerful your right. marketing message is going to be. Exactly. It, it, th- those are all excellent points. I mean, w- one thing I wanted to address was your question specifically, Jake, around, you know, the, the print buyer role, <laughs> yeah. if you will. Um they're fewer and farther between, sure. Um, right, but I think what what it presents is an opportunity for all of us in this room and all of us as print professionals, right? So as as we're talking to our customers, um, understanding what their objectives are, yeah. right, and and then um, weaving in because as print uh, as Tim said, print is incredibly valuable. It's incredibly trackable, right? So from a marketing perspective, that's really important, and I think we have an opportunity as executives in this print space mm-hmm. to help educate and, and help uh, <laughs> yes. you know, rhetorically hold the hand of our customer and, yeah. and walk them through that right. process. And I think you know, the continuum of seniority, if you will, even at this table, mm-hmm. we have a responsibility to help educate the folks on what print looks, feels like, and, and it will be changing. But I think that's, that's an opportunity we have just because you know, the, the gentleman or the, the, the woman that <clears throat> was managing 120 catalogs a year that are 96 pages plus four, uh, they just aren't that many of those out there anymore. They're on a beach. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Somewhere so, in California. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. Uh, but but that's, that's my, my take on it. So there's not the um, intrinsic knowledge of print in the industry anymore so it's our job as professionals in this space to help educate these people who are incredibly intelligent just perhaps maybe not in the print space now do you think the we've talked about this in in other episodes do you think the industry has done itself a bit of a disservice in marketing itself to a maybe younger audience as i mean social media obviously that's that's more integrated than just a marketing channel it's also a personal platform and things like that do you, do you think that the industry has done itself a disservice in marketing itself or positioning itself to a younger audience? You mean not positioning yourself to a younger <laughs> audience? Is that what you're saying? I mean, because, yeah, exactly. Because they, 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 really, they really haven't. I mean, I think the, the Andrew's point earlier was that it, it, the, one of the appeals for a millennial in this industry is it's change represents opportunity. It's going to change yeah. constantly. I mean, we're talking to uh, – uh, we're actually doing business with a company – that is a technology company that has changed the way that marketers can go to go to market with print. So if they're on the marketing cloud, Adobe or Salesforce, mm-hmm. they've got an email button. They press that email button, up pops a template, yeah. they populate it with their content, they upload a mailing list, they print go, and that campaign is in the customer's hands that same moment, right? Yeah. With print, you've got, this technology company has figured out a way 
to use an API to connect their technology to the marketing clouds, right? So when you press the print, bu print the button, print up button. pops the postcard template or the yeah. self-mailer template. They populate it with their content. They upload a mail file. It goes into the API of the technology company and gets sorted and sends it to 25 different digital printers across the country. And those printers are required through their service level agreements to get that mail out in two days to the yeah. post office. If they mail it first class, and there are many of them are willing to pay those rates to get the, the timing and, the, and, the, and the, the impact of the timing, you can have it in the hands of the customer in seven days, let's call it, all right? So yeah. one day for email, seven days for print, that's sexier than 30 days for print. Right. It's a lot sexier. And, and, and <laughs> so getting back to how do we market to the, the younger generation, you gotta talk about those kind of things, you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, yeah I, I think, so we do kind of a similar thing with web to print technologies. So where we're taking in basically web traffic data, and then we're, we're then kind of reversing it into a mailable name and address. And then to your point, if it's digitally printed, it can be variable, and then it can be in home within a week, right. I think. And I think a lot of that is a combination of print integrating with more technology that exists out there, the cloud and things like that. Um, but also I think we have an interesting opportunity, or at least I feel like it's an interesting opportunity where there's a lot of people that are first time print buyers, let's call them, or first time customers that don't really know the rules, right? right? So a lot of times they're asking stuff and it's kind of tipping over the apple cart or the established way but I think it's in a really positive way. So the expectation is, hey, we need to get this in home faster, which then, okay, well, hey, we need to start engineering a way to get it in home faster and yeah. things like that. So I think it's a cool time in the industry, but I definitely resonated with your point saying, it's a lot of education. I mean, I think if you just talk about the postal <laughs> side of the equation, that, that- You lost them. You lost them. <laughs> <laughs> And then, <laughs> hey, mail mail in a check to it's the like postmaster like general. Like what? Yeah. 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 <laughs> make your check it? out to make your check. <laughs> what? Maybe my, I've never heard that phrase in what thirty years. What? Can yeah. we just Venmo the postmaster general? <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't, I don't right. Know about that, but. That's funny. Oh, that's funny. Um, so I guess uh, maybe for my curiosity, maybe our audience, maybe you guys could touch a little bit more on. Lindemeyer Central itself and some of the things that you guys are working on specifically in, in, in that realm, sure. I suppose. Sure, I, so I'll, I'll speak to, to Lindenmeyer just in, in general. And um, I had the good fortune to come start, start working with this company at the, at the start of 2015. And just on a very, very high level perspective, you know, ultimately we are a, uh, an organization that represents you know, the mill community. Um, in terms of helping bring their product to market. And um, we have incredible scale in terms of number of feet on the street, yep. in terms of our, our buying power, just okay. given the fact of, of how much we're, we're uh, consuming on behalf of our customers. So we add a ton of value there. Um, you know, one of the things that I think we do really, really well, and I think is, is becoming ever so important, especially in a tight market like today, yeah. is, is we view the entire supply chain as so incredibly important, right? You obviously need the customer, mm -hmm. okay? But as much as you need the customer, you need the person that actually can make the product and sell the product. And, and that goes you know, to both the paper mill side as well as the, the printer side, yep. right? So I think you know, one of the things that we do is, is ultimately we, we take a lot of pride in the relationships we have with our customers. We think we, we listen well. We think we, we hear what our customers need and want. Mm -hmm. We, we ultimately try to bring the best quality service to the table, the best quality product, okay? And we try to align the right suppliers. And, and that's ultimately at the core of what we do. And uh, what I would say that we're gonna continue doing going forward is, is ultimately continuing to listen to our customers and understand what is it that they need, okay? And build solutions around that. Um, and I'd say one major differentiation point is our position in the supply chain, mm -hmm. is that we, we buy significant amounts, we pay on time, we pay quickly, and we treat the suppliers fair. And it sounds really simple, but <laughs> it, it does. It, but, but honestly, it, as I think we could all probably agree, that doesn't happen all the time. And um, acting with integrity is at the core of what we do. Um, and you know, we're, we're incredibly excited about the future. 
Um, we are we are doubling down in this business when a lot of people are running for the exits. So we yeah. want to be, you know, it, there's a book called Good to Great. You know, we want to be the world's best in this particular space, period. Yeah. And if we do that, we'll win. That's a great book, by the way. It is yeah, a great book. A great yeah. book. Still right. love that book. Y'all should read it. <laughs> yeah. Do we get any royalties? You know, for <laughs> yeah. We're we're trying to work that into our okay. deal. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. YouTube deal. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we touched on it a little bit, kind of in the last question, Andrew. You you kind of talked about it a little bit. Um, what I what we do have to talk about, I think, is kind of everything going on in the paper supply chain right now. Everything that's just been going on this year, the high demand and the price changes, things like that. Um, can you give kind of our audience like a little bit of an outlook, a little bit of an overview, maybe people that are in the industry but aren't as aware of the things or sure. audience members? I mean, the a, lot, a lot of you may know this, of course, but um, the industry has been going, you know, demand for paper has been going down for some time. Mm -hmm. Five, you know, started off two to three percent of a year, then went to five to ten percent a year. Depending on the grade, it continued to, to notch down. And of course, that's because paper printed products are competing with digital products and there's a lot of digital replacement going on in the marketplace. So I think that that mills were planning uh, to reduce supply consistently yeah. over time. We knew that. We saw mills being shut down. We saw machines being put on idle and so forth and so on. That was nothing new in the industry. And then COVID hit. So a lot of these mills who were some of, some of them being financially challenged, of course, um, took capacity out when the demand went straight downhill. Well, what, what no one was going to expect, of course, is that as COVID started to uh, wane and vaccinations started to uh, extend out to the rest of the country, um, demand for everything, everything, everything. not just print. Yeah. So Correct. all this all this stimulus money, all this savings that happened yeah. during COVID, um, pent up demand came out and now we have an economy that's going to grow at what six and a half to seven yeah, percent, probably yeah. minimum. Yeah. No marketer wants to be missing that opportunity. It doesn't matter that postage is going up eight to ten percent. It doesn't matter that paper prices have gone up three or four times already this year. It doesn't matter that freight costs are at at on, on an upswing that's pretty ridiculous. It doesn't matter that we can't get shipping containers from Asia. People want to print, and they want to print along with their digital channels, along with their social channels, along with email channels. All those things they want to be maxed out on. Because if they miss this this comeback economy, they're not going to have another chance again to acquire as many customers as they yeah, can right. when they're in the mail and they're in every channel. Yeah. So no one expected demand to come back that strong. Meanwhile, supply for paper had gone down significantly, huge mills. Um, in both North America and Europe were taken out during COVID. Some of them were planned, some of them were not. And as that capacity came out, it completely took the industry out of balance because of no one expected the demand we were, we were gonna get coming out of COVID with the reduced supply that we had going into it. So we have an unprecedented situation, probably the worst, tightest, I should say not worst, but the tightest paper market in three decades. And I would say, I would argue it's probably worse than it was back in the mid 90s when we hit that 94, 95 time frame. Every single grade is tight. Yeah. Every single mill is on allocation. Um, you can't get shipping. Uh, Guaranteed. Can't, you <laughs> yeah. can't get shipping on time. Um, everything is running late. Um, big customers, the biggest catalog customers and the brands that you know are getting uh, three quarters of what they are. Fractions, uh, right. fractions yeah, of, what they, of what they ordered. Typically. And so everybody's getting cut down to size or not getting paper at all. We're forced to bring alternatives to the table that include grades that they don't, customers don't want, um, cutting your circulations, cutting your pages to try to make the paper that's available work for your particular marketing need. And customers, to give them credit, are being great about it. They're, they understand the supply yeah. chain issues because they're seeing them in their own in business. Their own business yeah. uh, so when, when, when we bring them alternate solutions, because that's all we can get to meet their particular need, and all that our competitors can get to meet their particular needs, um, they're willing to talk and they're willing to look at those different alternative solutions. So as far as the outcome, and, and Andrew, I'll let you comment on this, I think it's gonna be very, very tight through the end of this year, probably getting near the end of November when it might start to see a little bit of relief. Mills will look out onto their order books and start seeing a need for a few orders at that point. 
Um, but these shipping container situations are probably going to last months beyond the first of the year. So I think we'll see some relief. The question is, are marketers going to want to be in the mail as much as they do now come the first of the year? I think that's the biggest question mark. And will that keep the demand and supply in balance, or will we still have a situation where we're undersupplied? I think that's the biggest <coughs> question. I'm not too concerned about being oversupplied right now because so much capacity was taken out of the marketplace. The big question is, how much are we going to be undersupplied come first of the year? Yeah. And it won't be as bad as it is now, but it could still be tight. So we do see some sort of light at the end of the tunnel, server lining, something sure. along those lines is coming up. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, I mean, if the economy slows down, as we know it, it could because of this, this, this huge <coughs> surge coming out of COVID and with the stimulus money starting to stop with uh, postage rates still high, with paper yeah, rates still, yeah, high, still high, marketers may scale it back, con, con, you know, significantly come the first of the year. The question is how much? And we really just don't know yet. So I, I won't uh, beat a dead horse here because you did such a nice <laughs> job <laughs> explaining Thank what's you. going on in the industry. Um, one analogy that resonates with me is if you look at uh, the decline of demand, if you will, in, in uh, just the paper market sure. across, say, coated free sheet, coated groundwood, and, and super calendared papers, it's a linear decline, right? If you take COVID and what happened last year, that obviously is an outlier, yeah. right? But you have a linear decline, mm -hmm. okay? And in, in the supply chain of where we're at now, the supply graph looks very differently because there's, while there might have been, let's call it, you know, I'm throwing out an arbitrary number, maybe 100 machines in, sure. in North America yeah. across, yeah. Uh, across a bunch of different grades. Today there may be 10, okay? And, I'm, and don't quote me on those exact numbers, but you get where I'm going with this. So what happens is anytime there's a conversion of machine or a shut of an entire mill, you could perhaps – you could yeah. – exactly. You got it exactly, Jake. So you could, in theory, take out 10, 15 percent of the, I the industry in a, in a category in one, in one yeah. fell swoop. Right. So, so what happens is, is it's a linear line, right, of oh, decline, yeah. and you've got this stair-step approach. And where we're at today is we're at that point where the stair went down, okay, and the linear line is above where that, yeah. that stair is. Makes total sense. And, oh, by the way, the line – on, on the demand the actually way. just went up for, <laughs> for a bit. So, so th that's the analogy that I like to use. So it, 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 as, as Tim mentioned, at some point there will be stabilization, I think we all believe. Um, but it's going to be a challenging time. I think the thing that I, I've been saying to myself every morning when I wake up and, and, and tie my shoes and go to the office is as, as professionals in this space, we have to communicate. Yeah. We have to be as transparent as possible act with integrity and act with grace because this will be a tough time. We're having tough conversations, but uh, I am personally a big believer that if, if we do those four things that I just mentioned, we will all win together and survive this. But it's it's gonna be a tough uh, next six months. I don't think anyone would, would debate that. So uh, that's, that's my take on where we stand today. Yeah. Cancel but your vacation in August. <laughs> But you can relay that to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> right, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> if I could add one, it sounds like be creative as well. Yeah. On both yeah. sides. Oh, be totally. creative with, be with solutions. So well, and, and flexible. Yeah. Flexible, yeah, yeah. Right? Creative and flexible. S such a great point. Yeah. Every problem has a seed of opportunity, as we all know. Yeah. You have to look at this as an opportunity to try something different. Maybe you add another format to the mix yeah. that uses less paper for the time being. Maybe that combination ends up working better in the long term. Who knows? You just what you have to do is give them something that they can hang their hat on, and reach their customers with. Yeah, mm. exactly. One one other thing I'll add too, because the, the the customer community I'm sure will be listening to this too, and this is something that is so foreign to I think all of us in this space, right? As as Tim and I were walking in the door today, we're like, can you believe we, we can't find paper, you can't find press time, and it wasn't that long ago where both of those there was. A, a gluttony of supply. Come on in. <laughs> right, yeah. The water's fine. Uh, Damn glad to meet you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, 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 it's just it's just a wild, wild time. And um, it, we, we will all get through this, I yeah. think, is the key. And, yeah. and uh, I think we all just have to look at overall supply chains, whether yeah. it be you're buying widgets from the Far East. It's hard to get those, too, right now. You know, right. so it's, right. it's, it's, it's just, just a very challenged yeah. – uh, just economy emerging out of COVID. Yeah. 
So despite despite some of the challenging times that we're currently in, obviously the industry is resilient. The people in it are resilient. Well, there's, you know, we'll come out of this if not stronger because of it, right? So, do you think if if you were a young person getting out of college or maybe just finished high school, um, what would resonate with you about kind of coming into this industry, whether it be a paper company as an example, a printing company? Um, what would kind of stand out or what, you know, what do you think still exists in the industry that would be appealing to some, someone like that? Well, I, 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 lo I look back, that's a good question. I look back on when I started and, and, you know, it's a different time, but what really appealed to me about a printing company, and by the way, when I graduated from college, I'd never even thought about a printing company. I'd read a newspaper, Same. never had <laughs> thought about how that was actually produced, didn't yeah. care, okay? Yeah. But when I learned about this particular company and I, they were offering a chance for me to join a sales driven company. It was a big public company that was driven by the sales force. They gave sales folks that are on the front line a lot of power to make things happen. They basically said that you're gonna run the symphony, the symphony is gonna be everybody up to the CEO behind you. That was appealing to me. Yeah. I, I felt like I had a lot of power. Second thing they said was, we're gonna give you a training program, we're gonna send you around the, all of our plants around the country, let, us, you know, let you meet all the folks, learn as much as you can about the product lines and the expectations that come from the manufacturing side of the business. And at the end of that six months, we're gonna assign you a sales office in California, and we're gonna give you a mentor that's a veteran that's gonna groom you to be a you know high-level selling professional. And I thought, wow, that's exactly what I want. I mean, my sales career started selling door-to-door -door, uh, cable television in West Des Moines, Iowa, and I thought, this is kind of where I want to take it. You know, this is <laughs> yeah, the natural yeah. extension for me to go. <laughs> so that was extremely appealing to me. So all that happened, by the way. All that happened except for the California bit. I, I, was, I was asked to move to Minneapolis. Uh, wow, I was wow. a, little a, little disappointed, a little disappointed. <laughs> but, but the irony is three years later, they moved me to San Francisco. So it all kind of worked like, out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I guess the point is, is that companies in today's mature industry can't beef up training programs and put people on six month uh, you know whirlwinds around the around the country it's just not you're, you're not able to do that these days so you have to come up with something different sure. but if you can feel a company is going to give you the ability as as Andrew has mentioned to, to, to talk all the way up the organization yeah. and feel like you have the power to make change in your own company that that's appealing to, a, to a, a, a young person. Yeah, and I think one thing that you kind of touched on that I definitely think still is very strong in the industry is that mentorship component. Right. Maybe it's not as assigned or structured, Right. Um, but there's, a, I think, a definitely a lot of knowledge that is looking to be passed down to some of the younger people coming in. So I think I've had great experience with some mentorship just throughout the industry, and I think that's still a pretty strong appeal for, a, I would say, the, the breadth of the industry. Sure. So, yeah, uh, Tim, one of the things that you mentioned that I think, you know, there's certain, like to your, to your point, I'm not sure that you're going to be able to get sent around the country for six months, but I definitely think one of the strong um, selling points too is that mentorship still exists in the industry today. I think there's a lot of um, knowledge that's looking to be passed down to the next generation. Um, so that's been kind of ex exciting for me. I'll yeah. bet. So I, I'll take a slightly different twist on that too, because I think Tim, you and I both come from the sales side of the equation, right? So we're very sales focused people, right? But I think, and I think a couple of things. One, number one, there has to be a, I think, uh, some semblance of a training program to yeah. attract people, right? Because these kids are coming out of school and they just got their, their bachelor's or whatever and they know how to drink 14 beers, right? I mean, <laughs> important. And actually, for sales, important. I, important, important in the print industry, like too. You know right? 14, really 14 well. yeah, beers right. for less than but $5. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Um, we could elaborate on that, I'm sure, <laughs> more here. But um, I, I do think there, there needs to be a, a pathway, a training program, and I think there needs to be some, le some level of a established pathway for, for these individuals who are looking to get into the industry. Like, okay, so I'm going to start in this role. What's the pathway to get to the next level yeah. and the, fo the following level. And, and I'll expand it even beyond sales, right? Because sales is one of those uh, professions or roles where it's very easily to, to measure, right? Okay, if, you, if you're able to bring on a new piece of business and you've now got a million dollars worth of top line, great. That, that you, you can elevate yourself just yeah. by, by growing your own portfolio of business yeah. inside of a company. 
But I think we also, as an industry, also need to have some focus on how do we bring in new people that are going to help on the marketing side? How are we going to bring in some new people that are going to help on the operations side? And, and I candidly am not the guy to, to speak to those different disciplines because those are not what I do. But I think there has to be something there, too, because – you know, as Tim and I would both probably agree, and I, I'm sure you guys would say the same thing, you can't have all salespeople, right? Because it would be a little yeah, bit, be like little, us. It, it would be a little <laughs> bit not, <laughs> you know, not functional. Um, so I think nothing I, would get done. <laughs> right. We'd sell a lot of we'd stuff. Sell, beers. Yeah. We, yeah, we, sell, we, sell, we'd sell. We'd never sell, deliver sell. anything, you know. But so I, I think there's there's got to be a pathway, and I also I'm a humongous fan of mentorships, yeah. and mm-hmm. uh, I just turned 40 this year, and I've been in the industry for I guess. 18 years now and I think I used the word last night with Tim over the third beer not 14 (laughs) last night but the third beer and I just shared with him I said that he's a mentor to me in terms of there's a lot that I'm you know I'm learning I I look at every day and and the mentor doesn't necessarily have to be a senior to you in age there's there's just so much that we can all learn from others in this business or other businesses and the mentorship thing has served me incredibly well I've learned some from some wonderful people, and I, I hope to continue to do that um, because I believe even when I'm 65 years old in the ninth inning of my career, I'm sure there's going to be people that I'm looking to as mentors at that point. I hope because yeah. uh, it makes me better. It, it never stops. No, you know, yeah. I'm I'm 61 years old and I'm re- reinventing myself in the industry. You know, I mean, yeah. who does that? You know, yeah. right? Why would I do that? You know, but the point is, is that is that I I want to keep growing. And I yeah. think that's yeah, – yeah, yeah, you, you assume that just the millennials want to be growing, <laughs> but the old guys also still want to keep growing. I don't want to do the same thing for the rest of my career. Here I you are doing a podcast. I was just going to say that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah. Is that why you agreed and to it, join? <laughs> um, but to your point about mentors, I think one of the nice things about uh, the, the Zoom, the Zoom – uh, uh, culture that we now live in is that you can do mentorship a lot easier because mentorship over the phone doesn't really get it done. You know, it really doesn't. It seems impermanent. It doesn't seem like you're really getting the full lesson. But I think on a, in a whether a Zoom or a Teams environment, you can actually you can actually learn a lot. But you got to work at it. You yeah. got to work at it. It can't just be once every couple months. It's got to be consistent relationship being built well said i think one learning we had tim uh, a couple weeks ago when we were up in the bay area with 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 a select group of folks from our organization uh, it was really the first time we'd brought a larger group together post covid okay and tim you make a great point i mean zoom is a big step up from just uh, a voice call right because you can get you know facial you you can you can you can get the nonverbal communication but I don't want to uh, assume, but I, I don't know what your opinion would be. There were a lot of things that came out of that meeting, and a lot of them were outside of the the, the actual room around the table. It right. was we went on a hike and really got to know some of the people we yeah. worked with, heard some of the war stories, if you will. <laughs> um, went you know went out and and had a few pops, and th- the just some of the stuff you you pick up in that interpersonal interaction mm-hmm. um, is so incredibly important. So. I know I'm going a little bit off topic here, but I'm really looking forward to getting back with our customers, yeah. with our colleagues. Right. Well, and and that, that's how you learn, and that's how you build relationships. Right. And getting back to the print industry, that's one of the really awesome things about this yeah. industry. It still is old school in the way that relationships matter. Right. Yeah. Right. And yeah. well said. I, would, I would say this, too, that, that you touched on it, and you guys can probably relate to this, is that I think one of the appeals for anybody joining – a young person joining uh, any company, m- not just a printing company, but is to have some camaraderie available to them. You know, because in our industry, it's hard to get um, everybody together. But when you do have people that you can talk to on a regular basis, you you build camaraderie. That gets you through the tough times. You yeah. know, when you have to yeah. tell your customer no, 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 over and again during a tight market. You got to just talk to somebody, and that's helpful. And also go have some fun and have some bonding experiences yeah. together. Camaraderie is what fuels sales. It's, it's, I would say it's, it's the essential fuel of sales. <laughs> if you have camaraderie, you'll find your solutions, you'll find your way past problems, and you'll find your way towards success just by having a fun group yeah. to do it with. So you know? That's such a good point. So one interesting uh, story I'll tell, uh, you guys be the judge if it's interesting or not, but I, I came out of school in 2003 
and I joined at, at R.R. Donnelly at that time, and this was post them having any type of formal, formal sales programs. It was a great opportunity for me, but one of the things I experienced is you go from being in a uh, college environment, if yeah. you will, and you've got all your buddies right there, either down the hall or yeah. uh, you know the street over, to now being in an environment, and, and I entered the print industry, and I had nobody else that was within 20 years yeah. of me. <laughs> and and where I'm going with this is that, you know, the funny part would be like work would be over, and I'd be like, okay, well let's let's all go grab a beer and let's talk about some stuff, and or let's go watch the ball game, and everyone's like, uh, no, I gotta go home. I got a 16 year old. I gotta get to baseball practice, and I and and. I don't have a 16-year-old yet, but I'm at that point now where I'm I'm now the 40-year-old guy <laughs> that if I if I go out and I have drinks after work, my wife's like, dude, you, you are you nuts? You know, yeah. you've been on the road for three days. So the takeaway here is, and I just came to this realization, I think if I'm a company and I'm in the print industry and I'm looking to lure in millennials, yeah. I think there's some value. It's almost like if you get one dog, you probably should get two. Not right. that I'm calling dog, you know, the people that would enter this industry well, dogs. Dogs. <laughs> right. No, no. But, I'm okay but, with it. Right, no, but, but, Better than cats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But, but I, I think there'd be some value is if you're going to invest in bringing in some millennials. It, it makes sense to probably hire more a than class. one at a time. A class. A class. A a class. Because a I think, pledge class, basically. It, yeah, a yeah. pledge class, right? right? Without the hazing. Right. right. So, uh, you know, you talk about camaraderie. I think it's important. And, and then all of a sudden you do have that built in social environment. And, and also with, I mean, with salespeople too, there's camaraderie and then there's c competition that's created right. inherently right. too, which is, which is healthy for the business. Definitely. Right. Well, you know, it's funny. I think we joke a lot about business in a bar <laughs> here in, in the podcast and, and, and it's just kind of the social component. It's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be a bar, but a lot more business and, and relationships are built doing things outside of the office. Right. Correct. You know, I think I, I really relate with that, especially in this industry where you touched on it earlier, Andrew. The relationships are so, so important yeah. to doing business. Agreed. So true. Yeah, I think you guys touched on everything I wanted to talk All about. Right. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to hit on. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we, we covered a lot. I mean, you guys even said yourselves it's been going really fast. <laughs> Is there anything you guys kind of want to touch on? I just want to say thanks for for having us. This has been actually a lot of fun, <laughs> and you guys are, are are two of the folks that I think are going to do great in this industry. Thank you. Um, looking forward to, to working with the both of you. I, I I also want to give a plug to a Randall, yeah. and it's a world class company that we we use as both a supplier and our as a customer. And just just look forward to continuing to, to grow with with not only you guys but but every everybody in this industry because I think there is a, a very strong future. Yeah. We just have to all be willing to be malleable, if yeah. you will, right? Because it's going to change. I think you. I think I will. I will just add to that to say that you guys stretched out and did something different, and it touched a lot of different groups. You touched uh, people in the in the in the in the, uh, in the trades that were trying that are trying to keep print, yeah. you know, <laughs> relevant. It touched your customers. It touched your suppliers. When I first saw the the uh, LinkedIn post that you maybe first made. Or uh, maybe it was the second ones I can't remember, but I thought, wow, what? Without even looking at it, I said, what a great idea! Yeah. You know, you hit, you hit on something, right? And just keep doing it. Learn. I mean, bring in, bring in perspectives from from inside and outside the printing yeah, industry, mm -hmm. and 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 learn from that. I think you'll you'll find that that uh, it's going to go a long ways. You know, you just keep building it. We promise we didn't pay them to say that. <laughs> just for everybody at home, we promise. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks yeah, again, thanks guys. guys. Really Seriously, thanks it. for yeah, coming thanks in and having us. Um, that's episode seven, guys. Uh, we thank you guys again for joining, and we will see you all in the next episode. <laughs> thanks again. Thank, thank you. Thank you.